I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. Welcome to the African History Network show. It is Wednesday, October 6, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. It's been a very, very busy day today. Had to teach a two hour online course, teach a two hour online class today, also of a special installment of Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we have a jam-packed show today. Uh, there was a story I was going to get to yesterday, but I said, no, we'll save it for the day. We, had, we talked about Tesla having to pay a $137 million lawsuit uh, to a former uh, black employee. We talked about some other things as well. We talked about the White House protests, pro protests outside of the White House um, for the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act. So there was a story that I saw a few days ago. Um, it's PBS NewsHour, PBS.org has this story. A number of outlets have picked this up. In Kansas City, at a high school in Kansas City, there was a pro-slavery online petition that was circulating that some high school stu students circulated and it was calling for slavery to be brought back. It was calls calling for slavery to be brought back. Now, when you um, listen to parents in this school, this is uh, Park Hill South High School in uh, Kansas City. Parents are saying this is not the first racial incidents. There have been a number of racial incidences, at least in this school district. And uh, Park Hill South High School is in the uh, Park, Hill, Park Hill School District. There was a uh, email that went out on September 22nd to parents to let them know about this uh, petition that was circulating online and the petition um, was circulated the week before the email went out to parents. Needless to say that many parents are furious and they're saying this is not the uh, first incident uh, of something like this uh, at this school district. So we're going to talk about this, but then also on the Black News Channel, they did a, uh, a segment on this. And I'm going to share that segment from uh, the Black News Channel because they had a uh, education expert uh, on in this segment, Dr. Chris Edmund, Dr. Chris Emden, Dr. Chris Emden. Uh, who talked about what's going on in Kansas City, but also in a broader context of these different uh, racial incidences at, um, at, at that's taking place at schools. There was one incident at a uh, at a school thirty minutes away from Park Hill South High School at Olathe South School. It's about 30 minutes away from Kansas City, Missouri. In this incident, it was there. The uh, school authorities are investigating a homecoming proposal poster, a homecoming proposal poster that read, if I was black, I would be picking cotton, but I'm white. So I'm picking you for homecoming. If I was black, I would be picking cotton, but I'm white, so I'm picking you for homecoming. So you have all types of idiotic instances like this that continue to happen at the same time you have right-wing groups that are pushing um, to shut down conversations about race and racism and systemic racism, white supremacy in schools and they are trying, in some instances, trying to get certain books banned that deal with the civil rights movement and deal with uh, racism, et cetera. OK, all this is taking place at the same time. 
So there's a good article from uh, PBS.org. We'll talk about that. Now, also on yesterday's show, we talked about, uh, I was on Roller Martin Unfiltered on Tuesday. Normally I'm on Friday, but I was on Tuesday. I'll be back on this Friday. And we discussed um, on Roller Martin Unfiltered and, and on this show here on Tuesday, we discussed the protests that took place outside of the White House, uh, White House protests challenging uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris on voting rights bill uh, ends in arrest. And the John Lewis voting rights bill, the debate started today in the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee. But the bill was introduced into the Senate on Tuesday, the John Lewis voting rights bill. OK, and I was sharing a segment here from uh, Roland Martin Unfiltered and we ran out of time uh, here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. I continued the broadcast on my social media platforms. I'm going to let you hear the rest of that segment because I was on the panel and Roland was coming to me. So you did not get a chance to hear that yesterday. We're going to share that with you uh, today. Now, also what happened today. So the uh, John Lewis Voting Rights Act was introduced in the Senate on Tuesday. And this is why the protesters were out there on Tuesday. And it was the uh, League of Women Voters and it was um, uh, People for the American Way. Ben Jealous was there, uh, president of People for the American Way, former national president of the NAACP. So you have um, Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont introduced the bill, the John Lewis Voting Rights Bill, uh, on Tuesday, okay? And it's going through the process. Um, th today, I want to pull up this article here. Um, today in the Senate, they heard from the top uh, Department of Justice civil rights official, Kristen Clark, Assistant Attorney General for the Civil Rights Division. And she impressed upon the Senate the need to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. All right, so that took place today. We're gonna to talk about that also. And then uh, yesterday, uh, well, let's see, what was it? Uh, Monday. Monday, we talked about um, the lawsuit filed by the family of Henrietta Lacks and uh, attorney Benjamin Crump against a uh, biotech company because and uh, alleging that this uh biotech company has been using the sales of henrietta Lacks and making millions if not billions probably billions of dollars off of them okay because uh, uh thermo fisher scientific uh their annual revenue according to their website is 35 billion dollars thermo fisher thermo fisher scientific according to their uh, website, their annual revenue is $35 billion a year. Okay. Now they're not saying they made all that money off of the, off of the sales of Henrietta Lacks, but, but they made a lot of money. Okay. So we talked about this on Tuesday on Roller Martin Unfiltered. We, we talked about it here on this show on, on Monday. We talked about it Tuesday on Roller Martin Unfiltered. And on yesterday's show, I said I would share that segment from, from Tuesday's edition, Tuesday, October 5th edition of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I said we would share that on today's show. So we'll do that. And then also um, on the readout with Joy Ann Reed on MSNBC uh, on Tuesday, October 5th, she spoke with um, the grandson of Henrietta Lacks as well as it was the grand, the grandson, or I think it was the grandson of Henrietta Lacks, as well as um, attorney Benjamin Crump. Okay. So we're going to, I'm going to, we'll talk about that some more as well and share that uh, interview as well. All right. So it's a lot going on. And then also this past, this past weekend, we had class number four 
uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. So we'll give you a, a quick uh, uh, recap of what took place in class number four. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, it's a very, very good class. We do a lot of history and do a history of what happened, uh, events leading up to the Civil War and what happened after the Civil War ended. All right. On the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it's correct wrong behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you can control the circumference of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. The sign up for our email newsletter. Um, Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. Also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and sign up for our email newsletter there as well. Okay, um, you can still register for the uh, new 10-week online course that I teach on Sundays. Um, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. As soon as you register, you can watch uh, the class we just did uh, this past Sunday. The class is 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are recorded. And you can go back and watch them anytime, even after the 10-week online course is over with. You can go back and watch it. All right. Uh, I want to jump into uh, this first topic here. Uh, we'll jump into this on the other side of the break. We're coming up, coming up here on the break. Listen to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest Black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our stories, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, Black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network. Subscribe now. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle her hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustler Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustler Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Current events of history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Unfortunately, many people confuse what racism is. Racism is a power structure. There was laws and policies that put us in this predicament. It's going to be laws and policies that take us out. So when you control the radius of a man or a woman's thoughts, you control the compass of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. We have it all on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation. 9, 10, the Superstation. Detroit's only African-American talk radio. 
Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotel. It is Wednesday, October 6, 2021, and we are live. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the calling number if you have a question or comment. Okay, so right before the break, um, I was talking about this story out of uh, Kansas City out of Missouri and you have a uh, PBS news hour. I saw a story from PBS news hour and uh, some other outlets picked up this story as well. And this deals with, this deals with um, a, a pro slavery petition, a pro slavery petition that was circulated uh, online by some high school students, all right? Now, uh, these were students at Park Hill South High School. And if we look at this article here from uh, PBS NewsHour, an online petition, an online petition to reinstate slavery that made its, uh, an online petition to reinstate slavery that made its rounds at a high school in Kansas City uh, in the month of September. 2021 is the latest in a series of incidents sparking outrage from parents and students who say race related controversies at the school are an all too common occurrence. Okay. Race related controversies at the school are an all too common occurrence. Now in an email, to parents at Park Hill South High School dated September 22nd. Park Hill School District Superintendent Jeanette Cowherd, C-O-W-H-E-R-D, acknowledged the petition, which was brought to officials' attention nearly a week prior by saying many people are hurting because, because of quote unquote, unacceptable and racist statements online. Many people are hurting because of unacceptable and racist statements online. We're going to go to clip one, uh, Shakita from KWCH. Now, and, and she added that Board of Education, quote, prohibits discrimination, harassment, and retaliation. The Board of Education prohibits discrimination, harassment, and retaliation, and that discipline could equal suspension or expulsion. Now, uh, Park Hill School District Superintendent uh, Jeanette Cowherd did not share any specifics regarding the students involved, nor whether they have been disciplined. The email also noted the district will set up meetings to quote, give the opportunity to share how they feel, give the opportunity to share how they feel. But parents say the school district is doing little to mitigate the ongoing problems. So the parents are saying this is not the first instance. This is not the first problem that we've had with racial incidences and bigotry. Parents say the district is doing little to mitigate the ongoing problems including individual attacks on students based on their race. Now, Jeff Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, is a, a parent uh, and said during public comment at a Park Hill school board meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, it would be, let's see, Thursday, uh, uh, two weeks ago then. Um, he said, quote, I have a disheartening feeling about the incident that happened at Park Hill South. I don't feel like it was addressed properly or, or at all. I don't feel like it was addressed properly or at all. He went on to say, quote, I've heard all of the nice kind words and I guess that they are okay. They are what they are, but they are meaningless, hollow and insincere insincere if we don't see action now park hill south is of it, it, park hill south is only the latest school over the past week 
to make headlines for its handling of racial incidents. Now, this article came out September 29th from um, PBS News Hours, one of the latest articles that I found because in certain doing research um, for this topic for this show, uh, this is one of the latest um, articles I found. It's hard to find more up to date articles uh, on, on, on this story here. Now, just days after the petition circulated, school officials at Olath South School, O L A T H E, school officials at Olath South School, which is 30 minutes away from Kansas City, Missouri, are investigating a homecoming proposal poster that read, quote, if I was black, I would be picking cotton, but I'm white, so I'm picking you for HOCO homecoming, okay? And I saw articles about this specific incident and in in, in it had a white student holding his sign up. And I was wondering, I said, okay, I wonder if that person's parents voted for Donald Trump. I'm just curious. So you have to wonder, okay, where, where are they getting this from? Picking cotton. What what do children know about picking cotton? They may pick cotton out of ears out of a Q-tip, but what do they know about picking cotton? So a photo of the offensive poster made its rounds on social media before school administrators caught wind of it. Now, National Education Association President Becky Pringle said these types of derogatory occurrences are not new. These types of derogatory occurrences are not new. Now, um, Becky probably means well, but I don't, is that a statement you want to make? These type of occurrences are not new. What the hell are you doing about them? I mean, the, the, when people say things are not new, my, my response is when, 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 when does, when does not new get old? When do we stop it? When does people say, oh, that's nothing new. But when does nothing new get old? Quote, all students, no matter their race or place, have a right to a public education in a safe learning environment. But right now, many of our students are scared, anxious and feeling threatened. Many of our students are scared, anxious, anxious and feeling threatened. What happened at Park Hill South High School is not an isolated incident, nor did it happen by accident, she said in a statement to PBS NewsHour. OK, is she said is not what happened at Park Hill South High School is not an isolated incident, nor did it happen by accident. Now, National Education Association teachers, National Education Association, a teachers union that advocates on behalf of educators nationwide has received reports of, quote, hostile and hateful environments, end quote, in schools across the country, she said. She said, quote, they have reported fake deep chin notices being handed out in swastikas drawn in bathrooms. They have been targets of hate speech and seen derogatory images like nooses, racist graffiti and threats to uh, LGBTQ students, she said. Now, when students feel they are not welcome, their ability to learn and thrive is diminished. Last were Park Hill South Principal Kerry Heron, H-E-R-R-E-N, apologized to the girls' volleyball team after making them remove shirts uh, that read, uh, together we rise, quote unquote, together we rise, uh, made them remove sh uh, shirts, these shirts that had the slogan on it, together we rise, before a game. The shirts were designed to promote racial unity OK, uh, Park Hill South Principal Kerry Heron said the shirts were designed to promote racial unity. But Heron. Uh, but Heron, then serving in an interim role, said the statement was, quote, unquote, political. And erroneously likened where the shirts to wearing shirts that would promote the Ku Klux Klan. So it was a shirt to promote racial unity together. We rise. Now, the volleyball girls 
had created t-shirts to wear in solidarity and i think the principal floor and made them remove them said judy stutterheim whose daughter attends lead high school lead lead high school and innovation program that includes park hill south students the incident continues to be a sore point for parents so it sounds like together we rise it sounds like it was uh a, it was to bring about racial unity but not but to bring about um to fight against white supremacy and racism it sounds like the the, the t-shirt okay together we together we rise that's what it sounds like the volleyball girls had created t-shirts to wear in solidarity and i think the principal ran out on the floor and made them remove them now joshua clark a parent who has one child in park hill school district and has chosen to send another elsewhere because these kinds of incidents shared several emails he sent to the superintendent all right hold on just a second We just lost our connection to the station. Hold on just a second. Let me. Call the station back. Stand by. Yes, yeah, Michael, we lost our connection. All right, all right, we're back. We lost our connection. Skype dropped the call. Okay, so um, right before the break, we were talking about this story out of Kansas City, Kansas City High School, Park Hill South High School. Some students there uh, a couple of weeks ago, about three weeks ago now, circulated a pro-slavery petition, a pro-slavery petition, calling a uh, petition uh, calling to bring slavery back and parents are saying this is not the first racial incident in this school district now uh joshua clark who's who, uh who is a parent who has one child in the park hill school district and has chosen to send another child elsewhere because of these types of incidents shared several emails he sent to the superintendent superintendent at the time asking why uh, uh, Heron, um, Park Hill South uh, principal, uh, Carrie Heron, he asked why Heron was subsequently promoted to principal after the incident with the, vo with the volleyball uh, girls team. He said, quote, it says to students and parents that the district does not care about black and brown people. He said, my initial reaction to the latest petition, here we go again, this, the, the petition to bring slavery back. My initial reaction to the latest petition was, here we go again. It is kind of unfortunate that things happen so much, you kind of get desensitized to it. Now, his son, Joshua Clark's son, attends the high school and told him about the petition. Joshua Clark, the parent, said he has emailed the superintendent his thoughts about the incident. It just seems as if Park Hill uh, School District is continuously playing catch up and apologizing and acknowledging racist behavior that goes on in the district after the fact acknowledging racist behavior that goes on in the district after the fact. He said he and his wife had issues with his youngest daughter's experience at the elementary school last year. He said some little girls at the school thought it would be funny to call her a monkey and tell her to go back to Africa. Some little girls at the school thought it'd be funny to call her a monkey and tell her to go back to Africa, he said. Now, Joshua Clark added that his daughter kept getting in trouble for responding. And as time went on, they decided to withdraw her from the school, from the school district altogether and enrolled her at a charter school. So 
I, I want to go to this clip here on on the uh, Black News Channel uh, on October four on the Black News Channel on October four. They um, discussed this uh, topic here, and it was a really good it was a really good segment. Um, Shannon Lanier of the Black News Channel spoke with educator and author Dr. Chris Emden. Educator, educator and author Dr. Chris Emden about uh, what's taking place in this uh, Kansas City school district. Let's go to, uh, well, actually, before we go to that clip, I want to go to clip one, Shakita, I'm sorry. W -K -K -W -C -H, KWCH there in Kansas City ran a story about what took place um, uh, about the uh, slavery petition. Okay, this is only one minute. Let's go to uh, clip number one first. Okay, you got clip number one. All right, maybe an ad you have to get past. Missouri students posted slavery petition online, school district says. We're going to uh, go to that clip and then we'll go to the clip from the Black News Channel. OK, we had a clip on here. Anything. Take it off mute. All right. Uh, OK, I guess we'll figure it out. Uh, I want to pull up this article here from KWCH. I was I was looking at a number of different sources here. Now, Black Enterprise has an article um, that talks about how the school district is bringing in a race expert or something like that uh, to. Um, OK, what would they do with the club? Uh, they had the OK, just go to just go to clip two from the Black News Channel, something wrong with the. Uh, with the uh, clip from um, KWCH. Just go to clip two from the Black News Channel. Reported that Park Hill School in Kansas City, Missouri will be hiring a race expert. And this comes in response to a number of anti-black incidents in that school district, as well as others across the city. First, there was the high school teacher who used the N-word during class and who was currently now under investigation. Then there was a report of a worksheet given out to students in English class with racial slurs on it. You see it right there. And as if that wasn't enough, a white student in Kansas City wrote the following on a sign to ask his schoolmate out for homecoming. And I quote, if I was black, I would be picking cotton. But I'm white, so I'm picking you for Hoko. And finally, there was the infamous organized by a group of students asking to reinstate slavery at Park Hill South High School in Kansas City. So joining me now to discuss all of this is Dr. Chris Emden. He is the author of the newly published book, Ratchet Demics, Reimagining Academic Success, and the Director of Science Education Program at Columbia University. Thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here with you. So, Doctor, you know, we're in the year 2021. Young people are supposed to be so much more progressive, and I just don't know what the heck is going on. Help me understand what's happening here. Well, you know, we could talk about this writ large, or we could talk specifically about Kansas City, which mm -hmm. is a symptom of a larger systemic issue. Uh, on a writ large conversation level, the issue is simply that young folks are not at all having, have, having had any conversations about race, about diversity, about inclusion. None of those things are part of what they're learning in schools. But yet, they're being informed about how they should form perspectives about those issues in the world. Riddle across the media right now is the banning of CRT, this conflating of CRT with the absence of uh, any critical conversation of having any, uh, any conversation about black folks or, or their experiences. And so, you know, we're not talking to young folks in schools about race, class, and diversity, and, and, and slavery and racism. And you're having a conversation in the political spectrum about why it should be demonized and not to be taught. And so the, you know, the, the largest political conversation is giving a signal to young people that society at large is in the midst of a not knowing what to do when it comes to race and class. And because of that, they're manifesting the ignorance that's being perverted on a, on a political uh, spectrum. So that, that's what's going on generally. See, in Kansas City, you know, they had a particular issue 
around the banning of, of CRT. They, in particular, had to have these long, drawn-out meetings and these back and forth and engagements. So, so, these, so these white young folks are literally watching the grown-ups on, on politically and also in their homes demonizing black folks and saying anything related to blackness is problematic. You know, when, when we say a banning of CRT, some white young folks in schools know they ain't learning about CRT. So they understand what the coded language means. They understand that when you say we are banning CRT, it means that we are banning expressions of blackness, we are banning the value of blackness, we are banning the, the, the recognition that black folks have any humanity. So, you know, for Park Hill to say now that we don't, we don't understand where this is coming from, why are these young folks acting in, acting in those ways? They're showing you what you've shown them. And then you're saying, now, I want to hire a diversity expert, or I want to have a conversation with an NAACP about how we can move beyond this. We can't move beyond this until you move beyond this. And so I want people to understand that issues in education um, that manifest themselves are oftentimes reflections of what's going on in society at large. We cannot treat this like it's an isolated incident of just some young folks who are, you know, crazy in a, in a newly progressive world. We don't exist in a progressive world. We've been aware of that by what's going on in the polit polit political landscape, and we have seen we're simply seeming symptoms of our racism play out with the next generation. So it sounds like that you're saying this is a long a problem they've had in the Kansas City area, not a few bad apples stirring up the pot, that they've just culturally existed this way. I've worked with Kansas City educators. I am in Kansas City once a year engaging with black teachers in Kansas City who themselves describe to me the racist sort of structure that they are going to, like thinking about quitting, quitting teaching because they can't deal with the stressors and the tension from the parents and the, from the community members. Uh, there's an organization called the Black KC that's, that's looking to sort of like get black educators together as a support group. What do you think those educators want to have a support group for? They want a support group for just navigating the racism that they're experiencing. So if the educators are going through this tension and the educators are themselves going through racial distress over the fact that they're not seen as pure humans, you better believe it's going on with young folks. So this is, again, not an isolated incident. Kansas City is just a microcosm of America at large, and what they're seeing specifically is them uh, attempting to erase any conversations about race in the larger spectrum, playing out with young folks who are sharing those dialogues from their adults, from their politicians, from their news. So don't be surprised when the chickens come home to roost. You constructed the phenomena, and now you're just witnessing it play out in real time. Okay, so let's talk about the nation since you brought it up, Ben. You know, we've been seeing issues across the country with, you know, blackface parties for Halloween jumping off of some places. Do you think that this sort of anti-blackness is starting to spread around the country? Because we also saw a lot of our white counterparts at the Black Lives Matter movement and marching with us and standing up for justice and equality. Yeah, I don't think um, anti-blackness is spreading. Mm. I think that anti-blackness is revealing itself. Um, if you just look at this segment that we've had so far, you know, we talked about the issues with the firefighters. We talked about the issues that are going on in schools. We talked about the issues as it relates to the COVID-19 vaccine. We, 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 uh, we talked about the issues related to the uh, vandalizing of the, of the George Floyd uh, statue in New York City. What we're seeing is simply uh, a, a visible expression of what it's always like to me. And I think that we've had under the, the past administration an endorsement of or a kind of like validation of folks expressing their bias in ways that support a larger political agenda. And so the racism that has already existed is simply being manifested. And what we're seeing in the schools is seeing how this is not just a phenomenon that's existing for adults, but, but for young folks who are ingesting what the adults have constructed and are not playing it out. You know, this is a large issue. We're not just talking about, you know, this one thing that's a sort of post-Trump phenomenon. We're talking about during the Biden administration, that's supposed to be a response to the Trump administration, young folks right now who are exhibiting these racist practices because we've given them a cosign. We've said to them, it's okay if you say it out loud right now. And that's a bittersweet thing. Bitter in the sense that young folks have to witness this. Sweet in the sense that we're simply now able to reveal what we already have experienced. See, when young folks in Kansas City were saying this three years ago, the entire structure in the city was saying, no, it's not really happening. How dare you? There's no racism. Now folks are showing you what we've been saying for a very long time. So it's bitter that it's out loud and our babies got to see it. It's sweet in the fact that it validates the fact that this has been a reality for black folks for a very long time in that city and across the nation. Well, some people believe, like those in Park Hill, that the solution is would be maybe to get someone in diversity and inclusion, equity, 
type of officer or race coach to come into the school to help talk to people, to counsel people, and tell them about the issues and what they're experiencing and how to get over it. Do you think that is part of the solution or the solution entirely, or is that just a Band-Aid? Sam, how are you coaching somebody on something and you're not coaching the folks who are the ones who are perpetuating the violence and the problematic issues? It, it, it defies logic. Now, this is not to say that we do not need DEI officers across the nation to be able to address these phenomena. I'm just saying they said at Parker, which ironically has a mascot that is the Panthers, but I'm sure some young folks ain't learned nothing about no black Panthers ever. But you're hiring somebody to come and talk to the staff around racist practices that the young folks are exhibiting, that they learn from their parents. Um, the house way is that supposed to address the issue. What, we, what we're seeing here is people who are enacting practices to pacify a black population who's frustrated with the issue by saying that we're going to hire somebody to talk to us about it or to coach us through how we respond to it going forward, but not to address the issue. As long as you have curriculum in that school that does not value blackness, as long as the state of Missouri is saying, we don't want to talk about race, class, diversity at all. In fact, we want to ban CRT, even though we're not really teaching CRT, so folks are fearful about talking about race at all. If you don't address those larger issues, having somebody to get coached or coaching somebody who ain't the one who's perpetuating the violence to address the violence is simply a way to pacify an audience of black folks who are frustrated with the infrastructure in that school district. So what is the solution in your belief besides pacifying people? Well, it's got to be a writ large comprehensive approach. As an educator, I recognize the first step is in teaching and learning. At the end of the day, the magic bullet is in education. What are those young, I'm not throwing away those young, believe it or not, I'm not throwing away those young white folks who are racist. I'm not. I'm saying there are consequences to your actions, and I also want to understand what got you to understand black folks in this way, and how do I create a curriculum a strategy, a set of classes, benchmarks in your school to ensure that you leave this place not holding on to that belief system. So for me, the first step is in the teaching, is in the curriculum. The next step is having conversations to the parents of those young folks. I, I, I don't believe in you saying, you enacted this violent uh, thing. I'm going to call the NAACP in, and now you suspended. All the, suspended, the suspension is going to breed is frustration because if you believe that what you shared was true, and you're suspended for your truth, you become emboldened in your truth, and you get folks who believe in that same thing to support you even further. So for me, it looks like critical conversation within those communities about what birthed the phenomena that led the students to enact these practices. So that's the next part. And then the last part for me is this. The, the, the black parents who said, I've had enough. I am frustrated. The ones who brought this issue to the fore do not be pacified by a Band-Aid on your issue. Mm. You must ensure that at home you are teaching your child that the reason why they are hated in this way, the reason why they're demonized in this way, the reason why they're being reduced to just being the person who picked cotton by those peers is because they are feared. And the reason why they are feared is because they are brilliant, they are genius, and they are magic. No one is saying these things about you because you are less than. They're saying these things about you because they are fearful of the power and the magic that you hold in the depths of your being. And mm -hmm. if they don't do that and teach them to, to teach that to those black babies in the school, then please ensure that you're teaching that to those black babies at home. Because it's only when they understand why they're being treated in this way, that when they understand why they're being assaulted in this way, it's not because you're less than, it's because you're excellent. And, and, and if the parents of those black children did that at home, if the school addressed the curriculum, and we had conversations with not just those young folks in those communities about how they've learned these things. We have a more comprehensive approach yeah. to dealing with this, rather than coaching the school on the practices of the kids. Wow. Dr. Chris, I'm glad you're out there promoting this message and getting it out there to as many schools and as many people as possible. Thank you so much for your time. I hope they're listening. Okay. I right, pause right there. That's Dr. Chris Emden. Uh, Black News Channel, October 4th, 2021, 20, uh, Kansas City Students Spread Petition to Bring Back Slavery. Uh, very quickly, Shakita, let's go to clip three. Uh, this was from Roland Martin Unfiltered on Tuesday, October 5th. We talked about the protests outside of the White House pushing for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Let's go to this clip. Look, it, it's real simple here, Michael. Um, you hear the activists saying this, Latasha Brown has said it, Cliff Albright has said it, and that is, these, you cannot out-organize voter suppression. And so it's like, Democrats, what the hell do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? 
Right. You know, um, this is all about self-preservation. It's about self-preservation for African-Americans. It's about self-preservation for Democrats in the House of Representatives in the 2022 midterm election. It's about self-preservation also for uh, Democrats in the Senate that are up for re-election as well. Uh, you have 19 states that have passed uh, 33 new voter restriction bills. States that have been states where it's already harder, states where it's already hard to vote, are passing more voter restriction bills. And then you also had 25 states that passed 20 that passed 62 uh, bills to make it easier to vote. So states where it's easier to vote are making it easier to vote. Um, Biden should uh, do. Biden was here in Michigan today. He was in Howell, Michigan today pushing his infrastructure bill, which is needed. But you also need to go on a tour. You also need to go to certain states. You should. I think you should go to Arizona, and I think you should go to West Virginia and do a speech there about voting rights. But we have to – I can't stress this enough. If this just remains – if voting rights just remain a black issue, I don't want to send it. Okay? It, it has to be expanded because – this impacts more than just black people. When you have these voter restriction bills, this, you, you have 38 million disabled Americans who are registered to vote. Okay, when you talk about restricting mail-in ballots, you're talking about hurting them. We just saw the women's reproductive activists, about 200,000 of them, uh, 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 assembling this, this past weekend. When you talk about restricting voting rights, okay, you're talking about hurting white women. You're talking about hurting college students. OK, so this, I, I, you know, I love John Lewis. I understand 65. I understand the Voting Rights Act. But this is bigger than just a, a black issue. And lastly, Roland, notice how silent corporations have gone. Because, see, corporations were putting out memos and things like this just a few months ago on voting rights. You, they, they've gone completely silent. OK, so also pressure has to be put back on, on corporations as well to uh, speak up and put pressure on, on politicians also, like Manchin and Cinema, who, who they help finance. All right. All right. Pause it right there. Pause it right there. Okay. Um, we're out of time here. Those watching on Facebook and YouTube, uh, keep watching watching us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, and our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Um, we're going to talk about... Uh, I'll share the segment from... Roland Martin unfiltered yesterday when we talked about Henrietta Lacks. Okay. We'll share that. And then there's also um, a follow-up now. Uh, can the Kansas city star has a story here dealing with uh, the Kansas city school district. We're going to continue this topic here because I have a response from the superintendent as well. Uh, Park Hill leader, uh, district hiring expert to fight racism after pro-slavery petition, okay? And we have a statement from Dr. Jeanette Cowherd. We'll share that off air uh, on my social media platform, so keep watching. The Park Hill School District will hire an expert to help create a plan of action to combat racism after students circulated a petition calling for the return of slavery, officials said. Um, keep watching on Facebook and YouTube. Right now, correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. All right. Uh, okay, so let's go back to let's go back to this clip here. Uh, okay, first of all, we've got the I pulled the clip up from W K W C uh, K W C H channel twelve. I think we have that uh, clip working. Let's see. I want to go to this clip here first. So this is from. Um, let's see. This is from September 22nd, September 22nd. Uh, KWCH Channel 12 in the Kansas City area. OK, they ran this story and. This is uh, a spokesperson for the school district. Uh, officials in a superb, suburban Kansas City school district are investigating a small group of students uh, who posted it online calling for the return of slavery. So let's see here. 
The Park Hill School District had a student population of 11,767 in 2021, this, the entire school district. Uh, only 12.7% of the school district is African-American. The district instituted a, let's see, let's go to, uh, let's turn on the screen share here. Okay, we've got this. Okay, let's go to the other one. That's Kansas City Star. Let's look at KWCH Channel 12. This story right here. Okay. So I, I went through and I was researching articles on this, trying to find some of the first ones I could find. This is one of the first articles. This is from September 22nd. Missouri students posted a slavery petition online. School district says KWCH Channel 12 um in the kansas city area okay so uh the article goes on to say the park hill district had a student population of 11 uh, 11,767 uh this year 12.7 percent of the school district is african-american now the district instituted inclusion and equity council with teachers in 2015, okay, the district instituted an inclusion and equity council with teachers in 2015, which led to student focus groups and eventually a family advisory council on the issue. So this is, this, these are actions they took in 2015. The district instituted an inclusion and equity council with teachers in 2015, that led to student focus groups and eventually a family advisory council on the issue. Terry Dion, D-E-A-Y-O-N, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, the district's director of access, inclusion and family engagement said district and school officials have met with student groups and staff at Park Hill South and at Lead Innovation Studio a separate school on the Park Hill South campus that offers a different educational approach to students. Terry uh, Dion said, I wholeheartedly believe we are in a situation that we are going to confront or and heal. We, we will be better and we will take this and use it as an opportunity to, to improve. Okay, so I want to go to, uh, let's go to this here. And then um, we'll look at this other piece here also. All right, let's see here. This one right here. Let's cue this up just a second. All right, just a second. This uh, this clip is queuing up here. Swift condemnation. That's the reaction from district leaders after a group of Park Hill South students post unacceptable racist comments online. It doesn't matter their intent. Uh, the impact is real. The impact is being felt. Uh, the hurt uh, is real and there. District leaders have heard from lots of parents since the incident Friday. You know, it varies from anger to... Um, to fear, to frustration, disbelief. The district is 67% white. While staff get diversity training, currently students get none. We don't have um, anything formal as, as far as like a, um, a standardized cultural sensitivity training or anything like that. Those are definitely things that I would love to see in the future. The district plans to hold a listening tour in response to the incident one silver lining, students were first to call out the racist comments. Students brought it to our attention right away. So the reporting culture at Parker South is working. This incident just further confirms the, the, the necessity, the need for the work, and that we are in, headed in the right direction. The district says schools are a safe place for everyone. In the Northland, Brian Johnson, KNBC 9 News. All right. So that is reporting from uh, KNBC Channel 9 uh, I guess KWCH Channel 12 picked this up. We're going to post this link here. You can read this article also. Now, that was from September 22nd. Now, 
um, the school superintendent uh, put out a video uh, in response to this and the Park Hill leader, uh, district hiring expert to fight racism after pro-slavery uh, petition. Okay. Now I'm going to go to, let's see, who, 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 do we have it here? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to go to this video here from the school superintendent. Let's cue this up. Straight from the straight from, straight from the superintendent. This is from September 27th. When some of our students posted racist things online recently, it forced us all to examine the work we're doing to make our schools an inclusive environment where all students feel safe to learn. We've been working on culturally relevant education, access, and inclusion for several years, but this incident has made it clear that we must speed up our efforts. Our immediate response was to identify the students involved in this matter and to follow our board policies and state statutes in the discipline for this incident. We are also providing counselors to support and care for students who have been hurt by this. Going forward, we have two options. We can react or we can respond. We are choosing to respond to produce a long-term solution that best meets the needs of our students, our staff, our family, and our community. Right now, we remain focused on listening to all of our people to fully understand their experiences, to gain a deeper understanding of the problem, and to set aside our own assumptions. We are currently investigating experts so that we can select someone to advise us. We will use the information we're getting from our community and from the experts to create the best plan of action for Park Hill. We will face this challenge ahead of us head on, and we appreciate the support of our community as we work to make our school safe and welcoming for each member of our Park Hill District family. Thank you. All right. That was from um, school superintendent. Um, it's Dr. Jeanette Cowherd, um, the uh, Park Hill School District superintendent. Jeanette, uh, Jeanette uh, Cowherd. That's from September 27th, uh, September 27th, 2021. So the link to that uh, video is on YouTube and it's in the article that we just posted here from uh, the Kansas City Star. All right. So you can check that out. Okay. Now um, I want to switch gears here. Let's see. Some of the, okay, let's look at let's look at the second story quickly here. Um, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act was introduced in the Senate on Tuesday. That's why the protests were taking place outside of uh, of the Senate. And we talked about this uh, uh, on yesterday's show. Uh, the protests taking place outside of the White House, uh, I should say, outside of the White House. We talked about this on yesterday's show. Okay, if we look at this uh, piece here, we we'll go to we we'll go to this next story. Uh, Kristen Clark um, urged Congress today to move quickly to strengthen uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights uh, Bill. Okay, before we go to that, very quickly, how's everybody doing? Share this broadcast on your social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in also. If you want to support the African History Network, you can support us. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and also through PayPal. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. PayPal.me forward slash the AHN show. And then also at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All right. Uh, we're here six days a week. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting. Then also you can register for the online courses I teach. Uh, we have um, a new one that just started up that's on Sundays, Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. We deal with thousands of years of history and what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We do this on Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, if we do the sessions live, all of them are recorded in archive. You can go back and watch them anytime. Okay. So visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Click on, uh, register here. 
takes you to the next next page click on enroll as soon as you register you can you can watch the class we just did uh, this past uh, sunday and we'll post a link here uh, also there's also bonus content uh for you to watch there as well as soon as you register okay so i want to go to this uh story here i heard a little bit i didn't hear a whole lot in the news yesterday about the john lewis voting rights act being introduced i i saw a little coverage of the protest we talked about it on roland martin and filtered also we just played the clip dealing with that but i see more coverage today okay i didn't see i didn't see a lot of articles um about this uh i saw one from uh, october 5th from uh, national public radio npr.org and they updated it uh they updated the story today uh because kristen clark is urging congress to uh pass the john lewis voting rights act the top doj civil rights official urged senators to restore the voting rights act um a top justice department Department official, this is Kristen Clark, a top Justice Department official, described voting discrimination as, quote, a current day problem and urged Congress to move quickly to strengthen a landmark civil rights era law. Urged Congress to move quickly to strengthen a landmark civil rights era law um kristen clark who is the assistant attorney general of the civil rights division for the department of justice said i am here today to sound an alarm for the justice department restoring and strengthening the voting rights act is a matter of great urgency kristen clark the head of the justice department civil rights division told members of the senate judiciary committee on wednesday october 6. kristen clark uh kristen clark's testimony comes one day after Senate Democrats introduced legislation aimed at restoring voting protections that were lost in two Supreme Court decisions over the course of the last decade. Shelby County versus Holder, U.S. Supreme Court case from 2013, and uh, Bernard, uh, Bernovich uh, versus Democratic National Committee. Now, gr Democrats have been pushing for federal legislation to protect voting rights. Democrats have been pushing for federal legislation to protect voting rights. Republicans have been, just so y'all understand, if you don't follow politics, Republicans have not been pushing for uh, bills to protect voting rights. If anything, they've been pushing for bills to suppress voting rights. Um, in, in On yesterday's show, we talked about how uh, 19 states have passed uh 33 bills this year is about 33 32 33 bills 19 states have passed um 32 uh bills this year to restrict voting rights now you've had 20 uh 33 yeah 19 states have passed 33 new laws this year to make it harder to vote um you've had 25 states that passed uh 62 laws to make it easier to vote states where it's already harder to vote are passing more laws to make it harder to vote states where it's easier to vote are passing more laws to make it easier to vote. All right. Read this. We talked about this um, article yesterday from CNN politics, CNN.com 19 states passed this year laws to restrict voting new tally fines. This is from October 4th, 2021, 19 states passed this year laws to restrict voting uh, new tally fines. Now, let's go back to this one here about Christian Clark from NPR. A version of the legislation, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, named for the late congressman and civil rights icon John, icon John Lewis of Georgia, passed the House of Representatives earlier this year. Okay, no Republicans in the House of Representatives voted for the bill. They passed something like 219 to 211. Zero Republicans voted for the bill. Just, just in case you don't know, no Republicans voted for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act in the House of Representatives. Now, the sponsor of the Senate bill, uh, Senator uh, Patrick Leahy of Vermont, who you see here to right, Senator Patrick Leahy, said he learned, he said he's, he was alarmed 
at the toxic and partisan rhetoric around restoring the Voting Rights Act. Sir Patrick Leahy, Democrat of Vermont, said, who's in his 80s, said he was alarmed at the toxic and partisan rhetoric around restoring the Voting Rights Act this year, noting that bipartisan majorities in Congress have reauthorized the Voting Rights Act. In the past, there was no problem with reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act, but because of Donald Trump and Donald Trump pushing the big lie and these other weak Republicans falling in line to echo this big lie that Donald Trump is pushing. Now, all of a sudden, uh, the voting rights bills are a problem. And reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act of the 65, now all of a sudden it's a problem. But Democratic efforts to pass any federal voting rights legislation including this bill have been rejected by republicans this year who have dismissed it as an unnecessary and a democratic quote-unquote power grab as punk ass senator uh, ted cruz did on wednesday okay little weak ted cruz who when he's up for re-election he should be crushed he should be voted out of office it should be a he when when senator ted cruz he's not up for re-election in 2022 um when when he's up for re-election it should be such a humiliating defeat that he wants to leave texas when 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 he's up for re-election the defeat should be so humiliating everywhere he goes people point at him people will point at him and call him a loser okay that's how badly he should be crushed uh when he's up for re-election uh senator rafael ted cruz lion flying ted cruz Punk ass Ted Cruz said this bill is an assault on democracy. Now, you kissing the behind of the man that led an insurrection, Donald Trump. That's that's how spineless Ted Cruz is. You you help you help promote the January 6th insurrection. You were there. This is spineless Ted Cruz. He says it's cynical and wrong. Okay, the 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 John Lewis Voting Rights Act. He said it's cynical and wrong. Now this uh, this effort is separate from a pared down voting rights and elections bill introduced in September 2021. That legislation, the Freedom to Vote Act, was the product of negotiations among group of senate democratic lawmakers including senate majority leader chuck schumer uh of new york west virginia uh, senator joe manchin uh who helped write the bill also senator Raphael warnock of georgia helped write the bill as well the freedom to vote act now the freedom to vote act would establish some federal guidelines on ballot access in response to voting restrictions enacted by Republican-led state legislatures around the country. Senator Joe Manchin had been the lone Democrat holdout uh, in supporting the For the People Act, okay, which was a more sweeping piece of legislation. He was the lone Democratic holdout on that act and has been in conversation with Republicans hoping to win over some support for the scaled back bill, but no Republican supported the bill, made Joe Manchin look like a damn fool. Joe Manchin said he could get 10 Republicans to support it. He thinks he could get it, blah, blah, blah. None supported it. So far, Manchin has found no takers among the 50 members of the Republican caucus because none of them are going to support it, Joe. None of them, because it ain't in their interest. To, they're trying to suppress votes. Ain't in, it's not in their interest to, post, to, 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 to pass a voting rights bill. No. Senator uh, Moscow Mitch McConnell has said it would receive no Republican support, criticizing the legislation as a federal takeover of state of state election administration. Now, it's not a federal takeover state election administration. What you have is you have Republicans in state legislatures trying to suppress African-American votes, Latino votes, Native American votes, and they're passing laws like in Georgia to be able for the state to be able to overturn election results at the county level at the city level that they don't like 
That's a uh, SB, I think it was SB 201 that passed in Georgia. So this is not a federal takeover. But once again, that's the that's the language of former Confederate states. That's the language of former Confederate states, federal takeover, who, who love to talk about states' rights. OK, they love to talk about states' rights until they need help from the federal government, like when there's a hurricane or there's some type of disaster or something like that. Even though Kentucky stayed loyal to the Union, to Kentucky was not part of the um, Confederacy. But you still have some uh, Confederate sympathizers in Kentucky. All right. Kentucky was one of those border states that uh, 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 Maryland, uh, Maryland, Missouri, Delaware, Kentucky, they stayed loyal to the Union. OK, but uh, they were allowed to keep their slaves after the Emancipation Proclamation, January, January 1st, 1863. But they, you have some Confederate sympathizers there in Kentucky. So Senator Chuck Schumer on Tuesday called the John Lewis Voting Rights Act uh, an, an important complement to the Freedom to Vote Act, and he's promised to hold a vote on the Freedom to Vote Act as soon as this week. OK, so uh, we know the bill was introduced on Tuesday. And it's in the Senate Judiciary Committee right now. Other Democrats. Democratic leaders who spoke on the floor on Tuesday included Sen uh, Georgia Senator Raphael Warnock, who's up for re-election in 2022 because when he was elected early this year, he's finishing out um, the rest of a six-year term. So it's two years left in the term. So he, he's up for re-election next year. Senator Raphael Warnock spoke as well. He said it was essential to pass both pieces of legislation. He said the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act builds for us a fire station to protect against future fires. The House of Democracy is already on fire, so we need the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, but we also need the Freedom to Vote Act. We've got to put out the fire. Uh, we're going to build a fire station for future fires. Now, Senator Raphael Warnock counted the uh, late Congressman John Lewis as one of his parishioners at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta and said that he believed, as John Lewis did, that voting is a sacred undertaking. Voting is a sacred undertaking. OK, uh, read the rest of this here. Uh, this is from uh, National Public Radio, October 6, 2021. The top DOJ civil rights official, Christian Clark, uh, urged senators to restore the Voting Rights Act. Okay, so we'll post this link here. You're going to hear a lot more about this as well. Okay, you're going to hear a lot more about that also. Uh, let's see here. All right, we're short on time. Um, I'm going to go to the, the, the clip from uh, the readout with Joanne Reed. We'll, we'll share that tomorrow. Uh, we're short on time. I'm going to squeeze it. Let's see. The, uh, we'll squeeze this one in here from, um, if you missed it from yesterday, this is from Roland Martin Unfiltered uh, when I was on. And uh, we talked about Henrietta Lacks on the panel. Uh, this is about three or four minutes. We're going to squeeze this in. Then we're going to do a quick recap of what we covered in class number one of ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa. Understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Okay, let's go to this clip here. Here we had a lax uh, is suing a biotech company claiming it's been selling her cervical cells without her knowledge or the, the estate's knowledge or consent. The federal lawsuit says Thermo Fisher Scientific knowingly mass produced and sold the tissue obtained through what it calls a racially unjust medical system. The sales in question were taken in 1951 by doctors at Johns Hopkins. Lax was terminally ill at the time, and her sales have been used for use in countless scientific research studies since. Her family says now is time for justice for Henrietta Lax. 
about time. Here, 70 years later, we mourn Henrietta Lacks and we will celebrate taking back control of Henrietta Lacks' legacy. This will not be passed on to another generation of Lacks. We stop here and we move forward to get control of Henrietta's legacy. And I would like to restore my family's honor. Throughout the years of watching my family go through what they went through, my dad being ignored in courthouses, my grandmother defamed by, she had to sign her name with the X. My grandmother had beautiful penmanship. It's in my book, Henrietta Lacks, The Untold Story, where I share my stories of my family's plight to get here where we are today. And God brought us here together over these 70 years. It wasn't time back then. It's time now. The time is now. All right, folks, the lawsuit wants a court to block their use without permission and force the $35 billion company to hand over profits from the Hella sales. Uh, what do you make of this, Mustafa? Well, the company should have already settled. It would just make sense that they've made billions of dollars off of this. There's a history of the extraction of black body parts. You can go back to uh, Dr. J. Marion Sims in the 1800s when they were actually experimenting on enslaved people at that time. He's known as the father of gynecology because of all that he did to black women. So this is just, a, it keeps playing out decade after decade. So I hope that this family actually gets the restitution that they deserve. Teresa. Yeah, it's a disgrace. Um, but again, I am just in awe. Again, history um, is now catching up to them. Um, I hope everybody gets their book. I mean, because again we, we can't allow these things to happen um and i think you know when we actually sign up and say we are organ donors or we are not we need to ensure that whatever medical professional are following the law michael you know roland this is uh great news i talked about this uh last night on my show um you know yesterday was the 70th anniversary of the passing of henrietta lax also not only was her uh, sales used in polio vaccine and gene mapping and intro, uh, in vitro fertilization. But also, um, uh, attorney Benjamin Crump said yesterday in the interview that it was all her sales were also used in the COVID-19 vaccine. And he said, um, her sales have been used since basically 1951, but the statute of limitations has ran out on a lot of other uses, but because of COVID-19, that's something new. And uh, this is something that they're really pushing in the lawsuit. So it's a brilliant strategy. Thermo Fisher Scientific uh, on their website, they said that their annual revenue is $35 billion a year. So hopefully they get everything that they deserve in this lawsuit. It's long overdue. Oh. All right, then, folks. Take a real short, quick break. We'll All right. So that was from, um, that was from, Tuesday, October 5th, Tuesday, October 5th, Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, we'll post a link to the full show that's on YouTube. The, the, um, you can watch it on YouTube and Facebook. This clip is from uh, YouTube. We'll post a link here to the uh, full show. You can watch it in its entirety. Uh, which one is that? Uh, Henrietta Lex. Okay, this one right here. We'll post this link here. You can watch that. All right. Very quickly here. And then read this article from NPR.org. We talked about this on yesterday's show. Henrietta Lacks Estate sued a company saying it used her stolen sales for research. Okay. That's from uh, National Public Radio. Uh, that's It was updated October. Oh, hold on. Which one is that? That's from, uh, yeah. That's from October 4th. October 4th, 2021. All right. So Sunday was class number one of um, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Now, class was supposed to be two hours, 
but I had a lot of information to cover. So we ended up doing three hours. So um, as soon as you read, actually, we talked about this uh, what, yesterday, day before yesterday. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about from the civil war to the civil rights movement, the black and black power, 1865, 1968. We did class four on Saturday. We did class number one of ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade. We did this on Sunday. Um, and then, uh, that class meets on Sundays, 12 noon to 2 p.m. We end up doing three hours. As soon as you register, you can watch that class. And we laid a foundation and dealt with some ancient history and uh, dealt with a number of different topics here. And we dealt with a timeline of history. So just to lay a foundation for class number one. But what I want to do today, uh, I forgot. I want to talk about class number four. Of from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power. I want to do a quick recap of that. We already did a recap of cl class number one of understanding the transatlantic slave trade. I want to do a recap of uh, the class we just had this past weekend of from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement in Black Power, 1865 to 1968. All right, so uh, we, we deal with history leading up to the Civil War, just to lay a foundation. And then we, we mainly focus on from 1865 through 1968, uh, Reconstruction Era, 1865 to 1877, um, Jim Crow Era. Uh, we, we look at um, World War I, World War II, Black Power Movement, Civil Rights Movement, okay? So we, we talked about uh, the Fort Pillow Massacre of 1864 led by Major General Nathan, uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest, okay, who uh, was also one of the, uh, is believed to be the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, Nathan Bedford Forrest. Now, you know, on the, on this show, we've talked about um, his statue being removed as well, okay, from the bust um, of Nathan Bedford Forrest being removed from the uh, Tennessee State House. And that was uh, that just happened a couple of months ago. All right. There's a good article on this. Um, that dealt, there's a good article on this here from a uh, source out of. Uh, source out of um, Tennessee. OK. That dealt with his bus being removed, but it, Washington Post. Um, has a good article dealing with the uh, Fort Pillow Massacre, okay? The Civil War battle um, where the Civil War battle that left nearly 200 black soldiers murdered. And Nathan Bedford Forrest had a lot of these uh, African-American Union soldiers executed even after they surrendered, okay? Uh, he's just an evil, he's just an evil person. The Civil War massacre that left nearly 200 black soldiers murdered. This is something we talked about um, this past weekend in class. Um, the battle began, the battle to regain Fort Pillow began April 12, 1864, when Nathan Bedford Force, Major General Nathan Bedford Force of the Confederacy, led 2,500 Confederate cavalry in an attack on the fort about 40 miles north of Memphis, Tennessee, according to uh, the National Park Service. The fort was held by Union troops, including 295 white soldiers and 262 colored soldiers under the command of Major Lionel F. Booth. The Confederates, including sharpshooters, unleashed a storm of bullets on the fort, killing Booth, Major General uh, Nathan Bedford Forrest demanded unconditional surrender. Although outnumbered by the Confederate soldiers, uh, Major William F. Bradford, who had taken command of the Union troops, refused to surrender. Confederates renewed the attack, soon overran the fort and drove the Federals down the river's bluff into a deadly crossfire, according to the National Park Service. As many as 300 Union soldiers 
including 200 black soldiers were killed. Many were shot point blank in the head. They were ex many of them were executed. Many were shot point blank in the head. Uh, now this was under the command of Nathan Bedford Forrest, who would go on to become a prominent Klan's member. Mark Lemming was the highest ranking union officer to survive the battle. His eyewitness account written, written nearly 30 years later on April 14th, 1893 would stand as a testament to what happened at Fort Pillow. Okay. So we talked about the Fort Pillow massacre during the civil war. Uh, we talked about how Lincoln was not an abolitionist and dealt with uh, Lincoln and slavery and uh, things like that. Uh, we also talked about special field order number 15, uh, 40 acres and a mule, what it was, what it wasn't. And one of the things about it, a lot of people don't know, is that that land, it, it was 400,000 acres of coastal land, 400,000 acres of coastal land is South Carolina, Florida and Georgia. That land was only supposed to be occupied by African-Americans and we were supposed to govern ourselves. It was supposed to be like a nation within a nation. Uh, Lincoln's assassinated. Most of the land is going to be taken back. Uh, President Andrew Johnson from Tennessee, who was sympathetic to the Confederacy, took all that land back, gave it back to the plantation owners, to the former uh, 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 slave owners. We also talked about the creation of the Freedmen's Bureau, the uh, Bureau of uh, Freedmen's Refugees and Abandoned Lands, the U.S. Bureau of uh, Freedmen's uh, Refugees and Abandoned Lands, created by Congress in March of 1865 to help uh, former slaves and destitute white people as well. We talked about that also, the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, special Field Order number 15, all of that, Juneteenth, we dealt with as well. And, and why uh, the Emancipation Proclamation did not free the slaves. Um, we're going to this weekend, uh, we it, oh, we also talked about the New York City draft riot, July 1863. The New York City draft riot, July 1863. We dealt with that as well, because that New York City draft riot took place after the Emancipation Proclamation. And you had white men up north in New York City who, who were going crazy because uh, they had to uh, either uh, get drafted and fight in a war if they were of age. Or they could pay a three hundred dollar fine and not go to the war or pay somebody else to take their place in, in the civil war. Well, $300 was, uh, that, that's like the equivalent of about $5,800 a day back in 1863. That was the average annual salary of, uh, of a white man back then. So only wealthy white men could pay that $300 and not go to war. And this caused a lot of uh, this, this caused a, a, like a insurrection. It's a New York draft riot. Uh, and these white men are going, they're killing African-Americans, destroying businesses, destroying federal, attacking federal buildings like the Jan January 6th insurrection. OK, this is a little known piece of history. And there were draft riots also in Detroit and Boston. New York City was the big one. The New York City draft riot was the big one. And after the Emancipation Proclamation, the. Um purpose of the civil war shifted from bringing the south back into the union to freeing the slaves and this caused a lot of backlash from uh white men because some of them were saying well, wait a second if you free the slaves they're going to take our jobs even though the majority of the slaves were in the south okay and a lot of states in the north had already freed the slaves but some of them were saying, wait a second, if you free the slaves, they're going to take our jobs. Here's an article here from blackpass.org. It deals with the New York City draft riots of 1863. And um, it, it, it deals with these attacks. It was anti-black violence that was taking place in New York City. When the draft came to New York City in, in July 1863, anti-government anger turned uh, anti-government anger turned to anti-government and anti-black violence, kind of like the January 6th insurrection and these white supremacists, the white supremacist domestic terrorists, kind of like them. 
the anti-black violence was driven by the resentment that the Irish would have to compete with freed people, freed African-Americans for jobs in the city of New York now that the union had embraced emancipation. Now that the union, the, the United States, had embraced emancipation. Because see, before the Emancipation Proclamation, the union wasn't focused on freeing the slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation was a military strategy as a, as a threat that Lincoln issued to the Confederacy that if you don't come back into the Union by January 1st, 1863, you're, we're going to free your slaves. Now, they had no they had no authority to free the slaves. They had the, 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 the Confederacy has separated from the Union, set up their own government, set up their own constitution based upon the U.S. Constitution, set up their own monetary system. So you can't pass laws that impact them. Now, you can go and conquer them and bring them back into the Union and free the slaves. You can do that, but you can't pass laws to tell them what to do. So what happened was anti-government anger that white men had in New York against the union talking about not freeing the slaves and, oh, they're going to take our jobs. And, and there are at least 262 skills, trades and crafts that African people had in this country from 1619 to 1865. So our skill set was as good as most white men in, in many cases, even better. OK, so the anti-black violence. That was inflicted upon us in New York was driven by the resentment that the Irish would have to compete with freed African-Americans for jobs in the city now that the United States had embraced emancipation. On the first day of the draft, on July 11th, 1863, the city was relatively quiet. However, by day three, July 13th, tensions boiled over. Volunteer firefighters from engine company number 33 were known for their violent nature, angry at their commissioner. They set fire to their own company house, which attracted an angry mob. Led by the firefighters, the mob continued down Third Avenue, ransacking and burning uh, businesses in their wake. They focused on those enterprises known to employ African-Americans, including Brooks Brothers, Harper's Weekly, Knickerbockers, and other wealthy businesses. So these white men are so angry at the federal government that they're talking about now freeing the slaves that they go and attack and ransack businesses that were known to employ African Americans. They also attacked the homes of prominent white abolitionists. When the when this when this white supremacist mob reached the colored orphans asylum filled with mostly women and children, African-American children, this white racist mob began to loot the building, the Colored Orphans Asylum, before setting it on fire. The 200 children inside were led out of the back by their benefactors and taken to safety. There were many accounts in New York City newspapers of black individuals killed during this riot of white men protesting against the draft. And they're saying, well, wait a second. You want us to go fight in the war and you talking about freeing the slaves. They're going to take our jobs. And, and wealthy white men who wrote the laws, wealthy white men can pay $300 and avoid going fighting in the war, risking their lives. We're poor white people. You want us to go fight in the war, okay? And now you're talking about freeing the slaves. We don't have $300 to pay to stay out the war. Wealthy white people do. So, so now their descendants had an insurrection January 6th. I, 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 keep, I keep telling you, the January 6th insurrection was a, is a continuation of the U.S. Civil War. The U.S. Civil War was an insurrection. Although there were an estimated, although there were an estimated 633 deaths, only 120 were reported to the police. This is in like four or five days of rioting in, in New York. This is the New York City draft riot, July 1863. How many of you have never heard of this before? 
This is the New York City draft riot, July 1863. How many of you have never heard this before? See, on this, see all that superfluous BS floating around on social media? We don't deal with that stuff here. We have to deal with like real substance. Of those, however, 160, 106 were African American. Of the 120 people killed, reported by police, 106 were African Americans who were killed. One account by Ibrahim Franklin's, uh, one of one account of Ibrahim Franklin's death was typical. Ibrahim Franklin was in church praying. He was a disabled man who made his living working as a carriage driver. He lived at a home and supported his elderly mother. The, 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 the mob reached him just as he was rising to his feet from his prayers and beat him to death. They then dragged him outside and hung him in the churchyard in front of his mother. Finally, they mutilated his corpse. This is in New York City. That's, that's the North. Did, you, you remember Malcolm X said, anytime you south of the Canadian border, you're in the South? This was in New York City. This wasn't in Alabama or Mississippi. Stuff like that did happen in Alabama, Mississippi. This was in New York in, in July 1863. Now, although the Union had won two major victories over the Confederacy at the Battle of Gettysburg in Pennsylvania and the Siege of Vicksburg in Mississippi, and there's a, Vicks, there's a, 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 there's a Vicksburg massacre in Mississippi also in 1874 as well. We talk about that. In the class as well, Colfax Massacre, Vicksburg Massacre, Opelousa Massacre, 1868. We do a, we do a chronology of history of 1865 to 1968, and it's like certain things that we go through and look at, and we look at the laws and policies put in place to suppress African Americans, to put us in a predicament we're in today, to understand where we need to go from here, to understand what happened in this history, and we also talk about the rampant voter suppression that took place, especially after Reconstruction ended. Now, um. President Abraham Lincoln was forced to send 4,000 Union troops to stop the violence sweeping across the city. He, they, they, had to send in, they had to send in the Union troops to, to, to put down this insurrection in New York, just like you had an insurrection in Washington, D.C., January 6th. With the arrival of the, uh, of the Union troops, including some who had fought at Gettysburg, the violence ended on July 16th. One of the ringleaders, John uh, Erhart Andrews, was arrested and jailed for his role in the riots. Several arrests were made, but there, but there were no other convictions. How many, how many of you have never heard of the New York City draft riots of July 1863? This is a deep history. So, so this is during the Civil War. To understand what's taking place today, we have to understand the Civil War and what happened after the Civil War ended. Because just as you have 400 state, just as you have 49 state legislatures, Republicans of 49 state legislatures passing bills to suppress the vote. This is what they did. This is what they did in 1876 with the Texas state constitution. This is what they did in 1890 in Mississippi with the Mississippi state constitution. 1895 in South Carolina, 1898 Louisiana, 1901 in Alabama. They, 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 were, they were rewriting these state constitutions in these southern states, these former Confederate states, to totally take back control of politics, society from, uh, from African Americans. Because we were, we were voting and getting African Americans elected into political office during Reconstruction. This is about 2,000 African-Americans uh, elected officials who got voted in the office because African-American men were voting, mainly African-American women cannot vote. So African-American men, we were voting. In, in, in South Carolina, the majority of the state legislature in South Carolina during Reconstruction were African-American men. And then when you, when you look at what happened in Mississippi in 1890, African-Americans were the majority of the population in Mississippi in 1890. The minority population, white people, 
changed the state constitution to implement poll taxes and literacy tests to suppress African-Americans and lock us out of political power in the state of Mississippi. I don't think, I don't think they've ever recovered from that in Mississippi. It was called the Mississippi plan. It was called the Mississippi plan. And they said, we are here to exclude the Negro. So if you, if you watched eyes on the prize, the original eyes on the prize, and they talk about the, the, there's a, a, a segment where they talk about the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and why it was needed. And there's one scene where they talk about Mississippi. And they said to be able to register to vote in Mississippi, you had to be able to explain to the satisfaction of the registrar one of the 200 plus sections of the Mississippi State Constitution. You had to be able to explain it to them. They point out which section they want you. You had to be able to explain it to them. A lot of those registrars were a lot of those white people who were registrars were illiterate. But that Mississippi State Constitution goes back to 1890. And the man who presided over the state convention to rewrite the state constitution, he was a white county judge named Solomon Saladin Calhoun. And he didn't beat around the bush about why they were here. He, he said, putting, it said, putting the voting issue bluntly. Judge Solomon Saladin Calhoun said, let's tell the truth. If it bursts the bottom of the universe, he said, we came here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short of this will answer. We came here to exclude the Negro. So we go through each class. We go through and analyze approximately a 10 year period of history. We look at laws and policies put in place. We look at our successes as well and in industries that we're building and businesses, things like this, but also methods that were used to take away land from us. How we get locked out of voting and, and all you got to do, you go study what happened in the 1890s and early 1900s. The same thing's happening right now in state legislatures. Except back then. We have more sense and realized, oh, they're suppressing our vote. We, we have more today. Some of us so distracted with Instagram and real housewives and in love and hip hop and all stuff like this. We don't, we don't realize that we said they, they, they're doing the same thing that they did after reconstruction. Ended. But now you have a declining population of white people in this country. And all you have to do is look at the results of the latest census 2020 census the population of white people in this country dropped below 60% for the first time since 1790 when the first census was taken. Now they knew these trends were coming. This is why they're fighting tooth and nail to one, maintain control of state legislatures two, implement voter restriction bills. So, so they can then take back control of the U S house of representatives and U S Senate. And, uh, also maintain control of state legislatures and his democratic governors that they're trying to knock out as well in, in, in the uh, 2022 midterm elections also. So a people's history and culture teaches them how to deal with the problems of the past and the present and the future to meet the needs of the community. When, when we start seeing what happened, and how we were attacked in the past, then we start better understanding what's going on today. And it's not about a political party, even though most of this stuff is coming from Republicans. It's not about political party. It's about understanding white supremacy and racism, really. And, and, and these attacks that are taking place, and this is in conjunction with the attacks on critical race theory. This is in conjunction with the with these false attacks on critical race theory to then try to shut down any discussions about racism, systemic racism, all this stuff, like in schools. Because you have a lot of people, you have like a lot of Republicans, they don't want this information taught in schools. Now, some white parents are fine with it. They want their children to learn. There was a, we talked about the study from um, uh, the Hill of um, uh, USA Today Ipsos that dealt with how uh, it was about 63% of 
uh, 63% of Americans said that they want their children to, um, over 60, uh, over 60 percent of Americans want children to learn legacy of slavery. And they were talking about their children. Read this article here from um, the hill dot com. This is a study. From September 2021, USA Today Ipsos study, over 60 percent of Americans want children to learn legacy of slavery. OK. See, now, so the the the. Uh, a majority of Americans say they are in favor of their children learning about the legacy of slavery and the ongoing effects of racism in the United States, according to a new poll. 63% of Americans polled say they are in favor of their children learning about the lasting effects of racism and slavery in the country, while 30% of people polled said they, they said they are opposed to children's education on the topic. Now that 30%, I wonder who they voted for for president. Read this one right here. Now, uh, so these, these are some things we talked about in class number four. We're going through history and we dealt with the uh, end of the Civil War. We dealt with uh, General Robert E. Lee surrendering to General Ulysses S. Grant April 9th, 1865. Lincoln shot April 14th, 1865 at the uh, um, Ford Theater. I almost said Audubon Ballroom. <laughs> we talked about Malcolm X also. Okay. <laughs> We talked about Malcolm X and uh, we talked about Malcolm also in uh, understanding the transatlantic slave trade because I played the clip of Malcolm where he used the term African Americans uh, for March 29th, 1964 in the ballot or the bullet at the Audubon Ballroom because uh, the term African American uh, goes back to uh, 1782 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, early, earliest recorded uses that wasn't created by Jesse Jackson. He reintroduced the term. Uh, okay, so we dealt with all of that. And then uh, we talked about the 13th Amendment, ratification of the 13th Amendment of uh, 1865 as well. I referenced the almost two hour interview that I did with uh, Dr. Daryl Scott, history professor at Howard University, who teaches a class on um, from mass from slavery to mass incarceration, because we talked about the myth that there's a loophole in the 13th Amendment that re-enslaved African-Americans after slavery, all this. The, the, the 13th Amendment is based upon the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. Most people never heard of the Northwest Ordinance of 1787. That's what that's based upon. The, 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 this law right here already applied to white men. They're giving to African-Americans the same rights that white men have. And then in 1866, you had the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which then protects African-Americans entering into legal contracts and different things like this. They're giving to African-Americans the same rights that white men have. OK, the, 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 the 13th Amendment didn't re-enslave re them. No, that's, that's myth. And that wasn't even that wasn't even when you talk you talk to abolitionists and you you look at um, contemporaries at this time things like this they weren't talking about the Thirteenth Amendment re enslaving them. Now sharecropping did happen. There were state contracts like in South Carolina that said that you had to uh, have labor contracts with plantation owners, what what have you. But that wasn't because of the Thirteenth Amendment. It's just like um, the um, Convict leasing system. Convict leasing system goes back to about the 1840s in Alabama. That's that's before the 13th Amendment. And the convict leasing system is going to be short lived. It, it ends in 1928 in Alabama. That's the last state to have it. But most of the other states had abolished it long before then. The convict leasing system. OK, so. There's some other things we talked about, but that's just a that's just a brief recap. Of. Um, some things, some topics that we dealt with in class number four. So uh, this weekend, we're going to go through and analyze the Reconstruction period, 1865 to 1877. And uh, we're going to also deal with the presidential election of 1876, uh, which leads to the Compromise of 1877. Compromise of 1877 ended Reconstruction, 
We're also going to talk about the failing of um, we'll talk about the failing of the uh, uh, Freedmen's Bureau. Well, the Freedmen's Bank in 1874. OK, we'll talk about that and we'll talk about the Freedmen's Bureau, how the Freedmen's Bureau was underfunded, not properly managed. It did do some good. But originally, the Freedmen's Bureau was only supposed to last for a year. And it's supposed to aid uh, uh, newly freed African-Americans to destitute white people. If you were enslaved for 246 years, okay? Now, African-Americans generally enslaved. Nobody was 246 years old. But if you have a people enslaved for 246 years, and you create a bureau to help them after slavery ends. Don't you think you need the bureau for longer than a year or two years? Because originally it was only supposed to last for a year and then it was extended. And, you know, it ends up lasting for maybe about 10 years, something like that. But if you if you have a people enslaved for 246 years. Don't you think you would need like a Freedmen's Bureau for like decades. The Freedmen's Bureau, formerly known as the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands, was established in 1865 by Congress to help millions of former African-Americans and poor whites in the South after the in the in the South in the aftermath of the Civil War, because you had a lot of poor, destitute white people in the South also. OK, they have a, a pot to piss in or one of the throw it out of. Yet a lot of poor, destitute white people. The Freedmen's Bureau provided food, housing, and medical aid. The Freedmen's Bureau also established schools and offered legal assistance. It also attempted to settle former slaves on land confiscated or abandoned during the war. It, they also helped negotiate labor contracts for African Americans. The Freedmen's Bureau also helped us find helped us to find lost loved ones that was sold off during slavery, things like this. The Freedmen's Bureau also, because they're putting, they were putting ads in newspapers to help us find lost loved ones. The Freedmen's Bureau also helped us to get married legally because this is one of the first things we wanted to do after slavery ended was get married legally because we always valued marriage. We always valued family. However, the Bureau was was prevented from fully carrying out its program due to a shortage of funds and personnel, along with the politics of race and reconstruction. So these are some things we'll get into in um, class this week, this this weekend, do this class on Saturdays. Uh, it's actually 12 noon to 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And uh, I, I had to create this class because this uh, this is this class comes after this class picks up what understanding the transatlantic slave trade leaves off because there was so much information that I deal with for understanding the transatlantic slave trade. And I understand how important this period of time is, 1865 to 1968, that I had to create a separate class because I want to be able to go in and really analyze a 10 year period of history in each class. So that's what we do with this one here. So if you want to, um, if you like this type of information, it's going to blow you away. You can also use this with your children. OK, I would say the information is PG-13 is not overly graphic or overly sexual or anything like that. I don't do a lot of cursing. It's not crazy. Um, so you can use this with your children as well. OK, we do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, video clips. There's um, this is another resource that we reference, especially in this class. You can use this if you want to take some of this information and uh, suggest it to your children's teachers. You can if you want your children's teachers to contact me and uh, ask about resources, what have you. That's fine. We can do that as well. Um, this is one of the uh, tools that we use. Teaching Hard History of American Slavery. Teaching Hard History of American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And this study is about a 50 uh, two page study, something like that. And it documents how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country. And then it makes numerous 
recommendations, really good recommendations on how to more correctly teach the history of slavery as well. Okay, so you can download that from SPLcenter.org, Teaching Hard History, uh, American Slavery, Teaching Hard History, American Slavery. That's at uh, SPLcenter.org, okay, Southern Poverty Law Center. And uh, they have a link there. You can uh, download the... Uh, you can download the uh, PDF of it. Okay, I, I downloaded the PDF, took it to a printer, and got it printed up because I use it as a, as a reference tool. Uh, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, who we've interviewed on this show, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries, uh, nephew to one of my teachers, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, he chairs the advisory board that uh, put this together. Um, uh, so he's an associate professor of history at. Um, Ohio State University, Dr. Hassan Kwame Jeffries. He's the chair of the advisory board that uh, put this together. He actually, if you watch Tiffany Cross's show, The Cross Connection on MSNBC, he was on two or three months ago dealing with uh, uh, reparations for Jamaica. All right, look, we got to get out of here so you can register for that class. Uh, visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. All this information is there. Also, all of my DVD lectures are there and digital downloads. Okay. AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, you can register for both of the online courses uh, that I teach there as well. Both of them, you can, um, uh, both of them, I would say a PG-13, you can use with children as well. All right. We have to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, you focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you tomorrow. Peace. Black on Purpose Television Network. Yes, Black on Purpose Television Network. All black, all positive, all the time. The largest black-owned streaming television network in the world. Bringing our people together worldwide. Controlling our messages, our story, our way. Black TV, the way it should be. Black music, black history, and more. 30 plus channels, thousands of shows. Black on Purpose Television Network, subscribe now. We all know the cannabis industry is headed toward an uprise in the past decade. What happens when there is a brand that brings this uprise in a blow? The cannabis industry welcomes her uprise. Hustle Her Hemp. Delivering excellence with pride is her watchword, and how you choose to embrace it makes it a priority. From cultivating rich cannabis into exquisite and tastefully finished CBD products to delivery, Hustle Her Hemp leaves no stone unturned. Hustle Her Hemp's mission is to empower women of color by building business and creating legacies, uniting beauty, health, and business. We are a pure definition of how we want the CBD industry to become in the future. While we are redefining innovation, we bring the same energy to improving the quality of life. Hustle Her Hemp is the new Uprise. Hi, I'm Joel Wilson, President and CEO of JCW Computer Consulting LLC, a technology implementation firm with over 20 years of satisfying customers. We offer a full spectrum of industry top tier branded services. We are an authorized partner or reseller for Lenovo, Zoom, T-Mobile, Microsoft 365 and Surface tablets, Google Workspace, Acer, Asus, Samsung, PCmatic security software, and many more. Our online store features laptops, Chromebooks, computers, printers, accessories, and software. Businesses, take advantage of our free one-hour Zoom tech consultation and know we offer top nationwide high-speed internet service providers, voice over IP, and cellular phone services. Home users, don't miss our current in-stock Chromebook inventory. Please visit us at jcwcc.com or call 215-879-6701. Gain knowledge in minutes from insightful summaries of progressive and socially conscious